Thank you again to the organizers for inviting me. This is the second talk. I had a great talk yesterday with uh, Andy Katz, another open source lawyer, uh, on um, open source, public open source law uh, uh, projects. Um, today, I um, want to have a very quick look at um, the, another work I'm doing uh, on open source in the area of um, R&D, research and development in university. Um, a lot of open source comes from universities. And we're seeing actually that although the projects are great and there's lots of scientific quality and there's lots of things going on there, um, when it comes to complying with the licensing and actually getting things right, let's say, um, things are not necessarily up to scratch. So I've been asked to advise in, the, in a couple of universities um, to, to help them sort this out and get into some best practices and processes in, uh, in working and managing open source in these projects. <clears throat> Just to situate you, um, uh, a quick user story. This is kind of like compiling some ideas together. Imagine you're a, or I am a researcher at the university. I've got to create some form of uh, AI model uh, for a hospital who wants to do some image recognition for, I don't know, bones or brains or whatever. Um, and so I'm doing lots of research and I'm pulling from the internet lots of already existing software modules. There's There's loads of open source modules uh, for AI already on the web. There's lots of models, there's lots of data as well, which I can pull, not just uh, data from the hospital because they're going to give me some images of the bones that I'm going to be working with, but also there are lots of databases of bones out there under so-called open licenses or not. And all this I'm running on an open source stack, obviously with Linux and various other bits and pieces. Um, to, to facilitate um, sharing, because this is a collaborative research project, with other people, with other uh, research entities, and I have to actually deliver this to the hospital, I'm going to containerize this uh, with Docker or whatever and, and deliver. So this fairly classical story of um, R&D at, at the university raises a fair number of issues in relation to what one needs to do to make sure that this is um, done correctly from a legal point of view. So. Um, Basically, what we, we hear, hear what we're having is that uh, research and development, um, which is a very open environment, uh, lots of freedom to, to research, to do things, freedom to share, freedom to collaborate, um, meets up with FOSS compliance. So here we got a kind of, they're, they're not at loggerheads, they're not against each other. But um, the idea is just to make sure that when you're doing R&D, the, 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 the legal quality of your work is, uh, is important. It's n probably not as important as the scientific quality, but it, it, to actually be able to deliver and distribute the software um, legally, you do need to comply with the licenses. So as we know from FOSS compliance, and I've seen that here backstage this year, a number of colleagues of uh, mine have been talking about uh, Open Chain, which I will mention, and other forms of licensing compliance and activities. Um, we all know that open source has a license. These licenses do have conditions. It's not free for all. Uh, that would be public domain. Uh, and there are some specific licenses, like the copyleft licenses, with this and um, the copyleft obligations to use the same license when you redistribute. Okay, so, um, and, and that's a little bit of red tape. That's a bit of a headache. Um, and researchers are not very keen in getting on with that. So, so the experience I've had is that, um, apart from the, the headache, I'm not really keen to, to do all the paperwork of looking at licenses and doing a license inventory, um, there's not much understanding or not good understanding among researchers of the different flavors of open source licensing. Um, and there's a general idea that, well, it's open there, we can use it. I'm at, I'm at the research institution, so I can do what I want. And unf unfortunately, that is not the case. Okay. Also, I find that um, uh, no criticisms, but but the, the software development is very disorganized from from people who are working already in GitHub or GitLab, and and have got all everything managed properly, to people who just do their work on their laptop and store the stuff in in G Google Drive or Dropbox, um, or even on the local drive. That that's a nightmare in terms of management uh, for the uh, research group, for the tech transfer office, for the university. Because if people don't really know where that software is and how it's been developed and managed, then very difficult to know the IP and can we transfer this or can, can we distribute, can we even release it as free software um, to society? Okay, and another dimension here, which is really important is there's a significant amount of sharing of code among developers, not just internally within the same uh, university. 
but among universities, among entities in these big European research projects with private companies, public companies, uh, public entities. So um, there's lots of sharing going on. And we know that when we share, we're distributing. And when we distribute, we have to look at the licenses. So um, the, the idea here is, is basically to um, look at the challenges that are specific to university R&D. They're not the same as private companies or as individuals working independently. Um, and see how we can uh, adjust these and what, what, should we do, what should we implement, okay? Not going to go through all these issues, but um, we're noticing that universities do want to release as open source, um, and they think, some of them just think that putting on GitHub, that's it. Uh, and as you know, we have to have a license, we need to check their IP, um, and there's all sorts of technical and organizational issues um, that you have to take care of as well. So just, just chucking up on the internet is not freeing software. Um, there also there are um, tech transfer issues here. Um, tech transfer is the office of the university, which is looking at the research and saying, what can we transfer to society? What can we license for money? You know, when you get some funding for new research, um, and and who can we collaborate with in society? You know, industry, public sector, to 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 work on these projects. And and obviously, when you're transferring out of the university into society, again we're distributing, we need to take care of the, the IP and, and, the, and the licensing issues. Um, so here comes the, the knight in white armor. Um, we've been working in the open source law uh, area for the last 10 years. Um, and you've probably heard already too much about open chain, but it's a standard now, it's, a, it's an ISO standard. Uh, and basically it's a set of best practices for open source development to ensure that um, in this case, the supply chain is compliant. So when you have a supply chain of four or five different uh, entities involved, um, the compliance goes down the chain. And so the person who's distributing it at the end, whether it's a car manufacturer or a modem manufacturer or whenever technology, um, they know that all everything coming upstream from other people is compliant and makes the makes the the whole uh, issue of of compliance much easier. If everybody's done their homework okay so there's a best practice out there and what we're trying to do in the projects i'm working on is to bring open chain into the university and, it, and it's not very it's not easy open chain is aimed at um, private companies large uh, industrial supply chains and although the universities are members of those supply chains you know this quadruple helix type idea um they're not used to the, the 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 diligence and the the rigor of of, of private companies and and proper I would say, uh, software development practices, okay? So what have we got? We've got a process, we've got a specification, there's even a website where you can go and visit all that stuff, okay? And what I'm doing at the um, these universities is trying to implement these best practices in the R&D departments. And it's a bit like hitting my head against a wall um, uh, because, you know, there's these large 250 software developers and or, or, or scientists working in, in biochemistry or whatever. And, and they're, they're not very keen to know about licensing, but it's important. And when they actually do get the, the, the story, they say, hey, yeah, that's true. That's really important. OK, so the, the goal is really is to ensure compliance, which is obviously a good thing. It makes, makes the university legal. No one can sue the university for breach of the um, open source uh, licenses, which is a good thing. Um, in, it's also to establish best practices in, in compliance, but also that's married to best practices in software development. Because if, you, if you're developing code uh, in, in a quality manner, you know, quality practice, then obviously the license comes in as, as an element of this quality. Okay. And the, the, other, the other thing of is, is, well, if, if you do have research software, which is properly compliant and IP is cleared and you know what license you want to use, then it's very easy to release uh, as uh, open source correctly. On the web or to, to anybody else. So I think it's an important thing. And all this kind of falls within the umbrella these days of uh, open science and making sure that, that um, when you do open science in this sense, uh, whether it's data, whether it's code, whether it's whatever else, um, that then you are complying with everything in, in the right manner. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the details of here. It's a typical mission of setting up um, some procedures and a policy, um, identifying the people who are going to be helping work with um, compliance, giving them the tools, 
training the staff. So it's a typical kind of like you know uh, mission to to implement some some best practices. Okay, and um, we did the first stage that we did last year in the middle of COVID. Um, Open Chain has five chapters. Uh, the first one's program foundation, so basically setting it up. Um, the policy, overall policy, competences. The second one is tasks, which is identifying who does what and with what resources uh, in terms of identifying licenses, identifying the code, storing the materials, everything. The third one is review and approval, which is actually looking at a real project and saying, you are using these licenses and these components, and therefore you must comply with these obligations. Okay, fourth chapter, keeping that evidence. That's really important because so many research projects um, just kind of let they start and then if there's no proof of concept or it didn't really work, it just dropped. The code's still there and they may even be shared, but you know you lose the evidences you have of what software was used and how it was used. Very important that point. And the final point, engagement, which is the final chapter, is best practices in engaging with the open source community. Um, and and getting contributions or setting up your own open source project and and building a community. Okay, so this is the, the project and and we we had some um, we had a first iteration. We looked at some projects, um, you know, quite quite agile style, and and we we got some we came to some conclusions here on on you know we we, we drew some pictures of how the process could be done and it fit into the specific R and D process, which is not quite the same process as an industrial process for building software for a client or even an open source process because that's much more um, dis uh, not disorganized but not coherently or necessarily structured in a hierarchical manner okay um, conclusions well um, the first conclusions are that that actually when you get over the barrier of, of being a lawyer <laughs> telling these things um, the researchers are actually quite keen on, on it. They do understand that there's a, there's something important there, um, and it's seen as part of the quality of their research. So um, that that's important. It's also seen as an enabler for sharing. So so if they what they don't want is to want to, to share code with another university or to deliver to a client, you know, some uh, contract research, and suddenly the the tech transfer office puts up a red flag and says, "Oops, sorry." This is full of GPL copyleft code, and we agreed to sell this under a proprietary license, you know, a commissioned, um, uh, sponsored development with a private client, and 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 that's kind of like a we have a uh, contradiction between the GPL requirement to to distribute under the GPL uh, and the contract with the private entity that they want the IPR and not to be bound by copyleft. Okay, so it's an important thing for them. Uh, they suddenly realize this is important. Okay, but there are a number of challenges. Um, challenges relating to aware, general awareness, so not just the people we work with, but but a cultural awareness that this is important. Um, there's usually no procedures and guidelines on how to deal with this. Um, you know, we can all go on Stack Overflow. Everybody now can go to openchainproject.org and they can learn, but it's quite difficult. Um, they need some tools. Um, we've worked with several departments. Some of them have a centralized GitLab and a great repository infrastructure, and they've taught how to use and, and work with GitLab, Git, Git, Git procedures, you know, pull requests, et cetera, et cetera, merges, fine. And they've got the repository. They can do a backup. They can store things. As I said, other people just do it on their laptop or a piece of paper. Uh, and then, then to do any license compliance there is, complete, is completely impossible. Okay, and the general end. So the second stage of uh, what we're doing. So we, we did a pilot. And we we look. We sorted out what the problems were, uh, we, and in agile terms, we we have a backlog of things to do. <laughs> we, when we actually have a whole epic um, that we have to deploy, but uh, work on. But anyway, so what we want to do is to set up um, a, co a competence center, uh, and this is becoming quite fashionable. Um, the European Union Commission has just published a paper. Or is about to publish it, but it's at least it's it's been um, made public about um, open source uh, in the in the European Union. And one of their big recommendations is setting up a what they call OSPOs, open source um, uh, offices, okay, competence offices. This is a bit the same. What we're saying is that well, someone in the university, and here it's probably the tech transfer office, because they're the most um, keen to get this right. Um, has, needs to have the skills, have the documents, the materials to be able to be an evangelist and, and transmit this to the research groups. Okay, so we're setting up a, a competence center. It's going to take us about six months. 
um, focusing on uh, awareness, understanding, um, getting concrete processes and materials for the research groups to, to absorb and to work with. Um, and to coordinate amongst research centers because universities have, you know, some big universities have eight up to 16 or whatever different laboratories or departments. And, and you know, you start one, one of them, but then the other guys get keen and then you suddenly have, you know, critical mass and everybody's very happy because we're complying all over the university, which would be brilliant. Okay, so here again, we, we're, we're going a little bit agile. We've got some sprints and some, some iterations. Um, apart from just defining what the competence center should do, um, I think there are three main ones. So the first thing is setting up an infrastructure. It's really important to have the tools to do this. Um, it's very difficult to look at source code if you don't have a, a Git type repository. Um, so that needs to be re defined. It's very difficult to store anything unless you've got long-term storage um, processes set up. Okay, and there are lots of tools out there to do this. There's scanners, there's code scanners, there's software 360 for storing the the, the information. So setting up the infrastructure to make it easy and to automate a lot of this is really important. Um, the second action line we're working is new pilots. So we, we're working bottom up. We're, we're going to, you know, we're basically seeding the idea in the small research groups, the bigger research groups, that they need to do some compliance work. And um, hopefully they will chat about it over lunch. Well, you we don't have lunch these days together. But when, when we do get together again, um, they'll talk about it over lunch and think it's a good idea. And then from one project, it'll it'll spin over to another project, and hopefully we get some again critical mass, so that so that the idea gets gets ad adopted and said let's do that and, and part of normal best practice, okay. And I think the third area we're working on is community. I think that's really important. Um, at the moment, a lot of research is done. There's a big research community, and they feel they are a member of a community, but it's a scientific community about the areas of science where they're working. It's not a um, open source community. So um, I think what we're trying to build here is is this um, get the skills and the knowledge into a minimum of people who are uh, who like the idea and who can help each other out. And so that um, the competence center is not that you know not the single s source of all information and know how, but it's it's a community of people who can help each other. Setting up the usual community, you know, discussion lists, um, Slack channels, IRCs, whatever the developers use to communicate uh, and and have you know online or offline events together um, around this this concept, and that, that that's really important for sustainability because we can go in and we can work for six months, but if um, if the the um, we leave and we know we leave the Stock Confidence Center and they have the staff and they do it. Unless we've achieved um, the community, it's not going to stay because researchers come and go. You know, over four years, you probably there's probably a rotation about 20, 25 percent, if not more, of the, the junior staff. The, the senior staff tend to stay. Um, and that's difficult because it means onboarding, it means bringing people in, it means bringing who, people. Luckily, universities are producing um, software engineers, developers, and scientists who are becoming more and more aware of open source uh, and license requirements. But um, anyway, if we have this community, if we have the events set up, you have the, the, the community dynamics, then we're hoping that this will be sustainable and, and that the certification, because there is an open source certification, can be achieved year after year because they've achieved the, the, the right amount of quality. Okay, so where are we now? Um, just to conclude, and, and I hope I haven't gone too fast through, through all of this. Um, well, we're setting up the competence center, as I said, and we're defining the materials and the processes. We're working with the developers. We're gonna go into at least another three, if not four projects uh, and do the homework for them. So we're gonna act as if we are doing the, the compliance for them. But the idea is in the next batch, which will be the second three month period, um, we'll be guiding the researchers themselves to do the compliance work, you know, to scanning their code, ensuring that all the licenses are there, make it, working on the uh, copyleft incompatibilities, taking decisions about licensing and what type of license do we want to use? Uh, and do we want to free this, you know? Um, and matching the code we have with whatever tech transfer, uh, um, you know, channel has been decided, you know, is this private licensing, is this open source, is this uh, whatever, okay? So um, that, that's important. 
Another area is, is, is that obviously this is to do with IP management. It's not just open source management. It's all intellectual property, uh, which includes patents, unfortunately, in the software area. So um, it, what we're looking at is integrating these uh, open chain style processes um, for quality into the general IP management. So, I mean, you know, you have to, you still have to know who wrote the code and how it was written, and with whom, um, and under what contract. If it's if it's a you know H twenty twenty development grant or something, um, you still need to know that. So, open source just falls in. It's another leg of of good uh, project management. Okay. Um, also, it's important to actually understand what the different universities are capable of. Um, some of them have the resources, have a central IT department who are really keen of setting up. They even have a Git uh, instance or whatever, you know, they've got they've got the capacities. Others, uh, specifically in social sciences, uh, who also do actually use a lot of open source, um, don't have any infrastructure at all, so or have very little. So it's important uh, to be to be able to get them on board uh, and and have the infrastructures for them. Okay. Um, also, uh, what we're trying to do is to match all this work into the open science initiatives. I think this is a, a very big and important topic. It's a bit late. I think this should have been done 15 years ago. But uh, open science is now a big topic, a big, big, um, big buzzword, if not fashionable. But I think it's a, it's it's a very good thing in sense of access to know-how, FAIR on data, F-A-I-R. I think we should have F-A-I-R on code as well. We should be thinking about that, you know. Um, and uh, there's some great initiatives on uh, conservatories uh, for open source code. There's, some, there's a lot of um, thought about um, collaborative research and open collaborative research. And that is absolutely matching the philosophy and the uh, dynamics of open source uh, as a software development movement. So I think the, the open source can bring a lot to the open science initiative and vice versa. Okay, so that, that's really important. And just finally, um, what the, you know, look, looking at what our challenges are, um, getting institutional support is not difficult, at least not at the research level. The university itself sees this as a little bit of um, you know, time that they don't have to dedicate to this. But, but usually, you know, with, as I said, with open science, nearly all universities are, well, I think all of them are, in favor. And so it's difficult to say, I'm in favor of open science, but I'm not in favor of open source, that that would be totally inconsistent. So so that's good. Um, motivating the researchers is the most difficult one. And and the unfortunate thing is, in times of the, 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 the COVID, we don't have pizza parties, beer, free beers, you know, meetups, anything. Um, I've done this before, before the, the pandemic. And, and just getting people to have a cup of coffee or a beer together um, and chat about this is, is actually worth hours of seminar <laughs> in a way. So hopefully when all this is over, we can, we can go back to being normal human beings and, and being social uh, and use social dynamics to, to, to get this um, transferred around and, and people motivated. Um, transfer skills is not a problem here because these people, the researchers, are really keen to learn. They've got big brains. They, they, they just take it on board as another step in their research projects. Um, and and the, the difficulty here is to, well, the only, the only trick is to make these skills seem interesting, sexy, important, um, valuable for their curriculum to get so, 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 so that when, if they want to transfer or they want to go from being a researcher to industry, um, they've got skills on their curriculum which are important uh, and they can highlight those. So that's good. Um, and as I said a little bit before, uh, working top down in open source is just, it's hopeless. There's no point. I've done, we've tried to do it in public sector, it doesn't work. You've got to be bottom up. So this is why we're starting in one department in a few pilot groups and going up. And the idea is to, to seed the revolution. Um, and then with some cross pollination, we, we, we um, get into some other research departments, social scientists, we get into biochemistry, we get into the medical department, where there's lots of open source going on, lots more than people think, um, and open, even more in open data. And they have to have the same practices for open data as you have for open source code. Anyway, so that's where we are. Uh, and that's what I really wanted to say, um, just to show that you know things are happening. And um, I think university, which is one of the areas where a lot of open source is produced, um, if they can get on board and produce legally 
quality open source, then we're going to be much easier. And a lot of the code on Git is in GitHub is going to have a license. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, it's great to hear that so much is going on under the radar in the academic sphere and uh, getting funding, presumably, to contribute to. <laughs> I live in Spain. Funding is like a, a strange word that we don't really know about. <laughs> in Germany, there's plenty of it, but it's, um, yeah, it comes with a lot of strings attached in my experience. But anyway, um, over to the questions. Uh, I'm looking again at. Um, uh, venueless and uh, for those who want to ask questions please put them in the chat in the meanwhile I'll put some questions that uh, came to my mind um, yeah first off how can we sign up for your newsletter because you said that's one of the things that you're going to be producing from the competence letter uh, sorry the competence center is there somewhere we can already sign up for early not, access not yet not yet not yet it's next week we were speaking with the, the communication people that's a great thing we're doing kind of like bonding with the other departments at the university and the communication people are important because they do internal and external communication so yes they but do. there's there's, there's, a, there's a newsletter that, there's a newsletter on Open Chain. The one you should sign up is, is go on to openchainproject.org and sign up for the, the, the newsletters on Open Chain. There's a lot going on there, and, and it's really quality work uh, with some great people um, who are actually speaking at the conference as well. So, um, you know, Shane Cochlan, Miriam Bauhauser, there's some great people there who are doing a lot of work. Fantastic, fantastic. I'll, I'll do that. And again, about the Competence Center, it, it sounds very exciting. I'm wondering how it's funded. Is it a pro bono project? How does it fit with uh, your work or uh, the others, uh, the other experts who are contributing to this? Um, no, well, the Competence is actually in the university, so it's it's funded by the university within the budget of probably of the, the Tech Transfer Office. That's outside my area of knowledge of where where the money comes from. Um, yes, I, I get funded for my advisory services. Um, and and my, the whole point is to do knowledge transfer so that the, the, by the end of this year, uh, that the, the competence center is up and running by itself. So, mm -hmm. and the funding, the funding, yes, there is funding. There's quite a lot of funding coming from public administrations for quality and research. And they're putting open source compliance as part of quality. Okay. Um, and there's funding in Catalonia than the PETR, PETA projects. There's funding in the European Union um, and probably from the other uh, entities for, for this concept of quality and open science. So that's where I'd look for budget. No, that's very interesting. And speaking to quality, so I, I understood, I think, the point about um, quality in terms of the software being more discoverable, uh, more reusable, more likely to be incorporated into other projects. Um, but uh, about the reproducibility of research that you mentioned, how is that affected by the compliance work that you and the Competence Center are going to be doing? Well, if, if you've got code which is not legal because you're not complying with the licenses, you're not entitled to reproduce it. Um, this is as simple as that. Um, you can download it and do what you want illegally because if it's not complying with the copyleft licenses, it hasn't got the copyright notices. Boring stuff that the lawyers deal with, but actually the, the bread and butter of making open source work. Um, uh, you can't reproduce it because you, you can't transfer. If you can't transfer, then you, no one else can check it out and whether that, that code actually works. So that would, that, I mean, that would actually be a practical problem. The researchers, even if they're just downloading software for their own machine and then they produce a, a research paper or, or yes, they'd make some discovery or that questions might be asked about the software they were using and whether they had licenses to use it in the first place. Yeah, a little bit. I think, that, as I said, they, they live in a little bubble where, where people don't really ask those questions. And um, the trouble is when you, when you transfer out to industry and you've got banks who are taking this up or automotive or, or you know, pharma, they're going to mm -hmm. ask difficult questions. Um, they say, well, can I use this? How can I use this? Can I build on this? Can I transfer this to someone else? Can I sell it? And if mm -hmm. they suddenly say, oh, this is full of copyleft stuff, which is great for the community, but industry is still a little bit reluctant. To, to, to working with copyleft, or they don't know how to, unfortunately. So, yeah. so um, that, that's where the kind of head, headaches can, can come from. Yeah, that's great. And uh, it's, a, it's a big issue um, uh, I've seen as well. Um, and so about the certificates, you mentioned some compliance certificates. That sounds like a, a potentially interesting concept that could have uh, yeah, wider application. Uh, has there been much thought put to that yet, or is it is it just? Yeah, a, well, it's 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 part of the open chain process. Um, it's self certification. Oh, right. So so, okay. so um, if you go on the open chain project site, um, there's all the information there to actually come into compliance with the specification. So you can build your own process and everything. And at the end, there's a kind of a, a certification questionnaire where you you tick all the right boxes and you say, guys, I'm I'm, I, you know, I'm I'm compliant. So it's a little bit informal, as you said, it's self-certification. Now that we are an ISO, uh, formal ISO standard, um, I'm sure that 
it may move to a more formalized thing that some third party um, auditor or, or qualified um, standards um, you know, verifier, whatever, they are, can, can give their, their official seal of approval or whatever. But I mean, for the moment, we're working open source. We do our things ourselves and we do, you know, we trust. So, and, and transparency provides, you know, helps trust. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, but the certification scheme's there and you can, you can read the questionnaire. And if you tick all the boxes, you can say, you can go and put your logo on the website and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the next one who's, who's uh, compliant. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, has there been any thought put to campaigns around raising awareness of the work that the, the Compliance Center will be doing? I know it's early on and you're getting your publications up and running, but you know there seems to be some overlap um, with, for example, uh, other NGOs in the field, uh, FSFE or uh, you know, Open Source Initiative. Yeah, well, well, I mean, FSFE and Open Source have been with uh, Open Chain for a long time. Linux Foundation is, is, is it's, it's now uh, hosted at Linux Foundation. Um, and there's lots of noise about that. If you just look up Open Chain Project and uh, Open Source, and you'll find that there's Shane Cochlin is, is, is the greatest communicator in the world, just about. Um, so, so on Open Chain itself, yes, there's lots of noise. In Open Chain, in university, no, this is the first project I know about. So, 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 so we're not, we're not, uh, next week, when we speak to the communications guy, um, girl, she, she, she will be telling us when and, and how we, how we can communicate this. Um, uh, I think we won't be able to do it until the summer, but we'll, we'll get, we'll get it out there. We'll be writing some stuff about this. I imagine students would be a very receptive audience for, for all sorts of reasons. So I, I hope that the outreach there is successful over time. Yeah, oh, we may have an exam. We should have an open chain exam just to make them see if they can graduate. <laughs> Could be part of the grant application process. Exactly. Uh, exactly. That's great. Um, thank you so much.